and then so on. Good afternoon and welcome. Thanks for joining the webinar on creating an anti-fraud culture. I've just got the webcam on for a few minutes just to introduce myself and so you can see me. Um, I need to check with you, can you see and hear me? If you can raise your hands on the right hand side of the screen, I can just check that you can all see and hear me. Okay, great. Okay, well I'm going to start the webinar now, so I'm going to turn the webcam off. Great. So, to start off, a little bit about me. So, I'm Rachel Tiffin. I'm the head of the Counter Fraud Centre at SIPFA and also the head of the Governance Faculty. I have a team of people who deliver tools and services to the public sector. And my background is, prior to SIPFA, um, I was Head of Fraud at the Ministry of Defence, and prior to that I worked at the Home Office. And then I have about 20 years' experience in local government. So I've got quite a background in counter-fraud. So a little bit about logistics. So we're going to run for about 45 minutes and there'll be time for questions along the way and I've got a couple of votes to go through with you as well. So how can we talk? Okay, well you can ask questions on the right hand side of your screen um, is an area where you can type questions in and I'll either pick them up during the course of the webinar or at the end. Okay, so. What am I going to cover today? Well, I'm going to talk a bit about the landscape of fraud, um, counter-fraud, where what the figures are like. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what is an anti-fraud culture? Uh, why is it important? How do you create an anti-fraud culture? What are the roles and responsibilities? How do you measure it? And then a tiny bit about the SIT for Counter-Fraud Centre. So, it's important to have some context about an anti-fraud culture. So looking at the figures, well, fraud is on the increase. So I've got a couple of figures here to give you an idea of the scale and volume of fraud across the world. So in the UK, some of you will know of the annual fraud indicator published by the Home Office. The last annual fraud indicator was in 2013, and the figure in that was 52 billion across the board, hidden and detected estimates. A study by Kroll in the same year showed that at least 70% of companies reported at least one type of fraud. So what types of fraud are there? Now my point here is that fraud is not very different wherever you go. So in the UK, we've got some types of fraud listed that were in the annual fraud indicator. Insider, procurement, grants, cyber, and then we've got fraud enablers, so things like identity and false, false documents. So they're things really that people use to enable fraud. And there's a fraud against charities and fraud against individuals. Now across the world, looking back at that Kroll study, they also list fraud as procurement, insider, information theft, and cyber. So you can see there's not a lot of difference. And so really, can having an anti-fraud culture make a difference? Well, my personal opinion is yes, that it can. And so I think the important thing to do is to have a strategy across the board which is linked to having an anti-fraud culture. So a robust counter-fraud strategy should have several elements in it, of which an anti-fraud culture is part. And so I'm going to run through these. I've got a diagram on the next slide, which I'll take you through in a little bit more detail. But prevention, detection, deterrence, investigations, sanction and redress. And underpinning all of that, we have the anti-fraud culture, but we also have something which is toned from the top, which I'm going to pick upon quite a few times throughout the presentation. So here's my diagram. And as you can see, there's a little bit more detail here about what those elements 
of a robust strategy might be. And in a few minutes, I'm going to go through these in some detail and link them back to why they're part of having a good anti-fraud culture. But you can see that I've listed some of the areas that are part of an anti-fraud culture, awareness, training, having an ethically robust culture. And then going through the elements on the left-hand side, prevention, deterrence, detection, investigations, sanction and redress. And the arrows down the middle showing that things are interchangeable and all interlinked. So, going into prevention and detection, what's it about really? Well, it's about controls and being visible and closing the gateway. It's about knowing what your risks are and then being able to act on them. And then it's about publicity, not just publicity where you tell the local local community that you've prosecuted someone, but publicity within your organisation, publicity that things happen, and publicity that you have a counter-fraud team, you have a whistleblowing line, and what you do with your whistleblowing referrals. So I'm going to talk about whistleblowing in detail in a few minutes, but um, it's very important to have a good whistleblowing line because uh, you can get very good referrals from, from them and staff who whistleblow uh, are people who work in the organisation who may hear things that you may not hear. So it's important that you have a whistleblowing line that people have confidence in. And sharing information. So one of the areas here would be analytics, uh, where you might share information across the council or across different departments or across uh, organisations across the sector. Um, and it's really important to share information because, as we all know, fraudsters don't respect boundaries. They don't respect geographical boundaries and they don't respect boundaries across the sector. So someone who might be committing fraud in the NHS might also be committing fraud in a council or in the DWP. And then I've got a little slot here on pre-employment screening where I'm going to give you some case studies in a few minutes. Um, but I think it's really important that when you're closing the gateway that you think about staff as well and you make sure that the people that are working for you are trustworthy also. So I've got a case study here on transparency and really it's about what could have been prevented. So as part of a transparency initiative, an organisation put their details of their suppliers online and they were called by the, by the supplier asked to change their bank accounts bank account details. The staff member took the details and changed them very quickly. The next two payments went to the fraudster. Well, they only knew when the genuine supplier called up to find out when their money was, two payments later. Now, if there had been training and publicity about it at the time, then perhaps this fraud, in this instance, could have been prevented. Now, some of you will know this type of fraud and uh, it wasn't prevented here and in many other places. And in fact, it's it spread and it's changed into many different things and we now have a name for it and we call it mandate fraud. And so on this page here, I've said everyone was hit and a lot of people were hit, a lot more people that, than I have put down here. And to the extent that action fraud, uh, the national hotline has has a page on dealing with mandate fraud and how you can prevent it. So you can see there's some huge sums of money here uh, ranging from £138 up to in one case five, £5 million. So the importance of prevention is clear here and it's about sharing information with colleagues. So I've got another case study here. Uh, this is duplicate and false invoices where a construction company won a contract and submitted invoices for work. They were accidentally paid twice by the organisation and that they realised that the mistake hadn't been spotted so they started to submit more with exaggerated amounts and the work hadn't been done and the staff only realised that they were overpaying and the pro when the project was over budget, the work was incomplete and then they started asking questions. The construction company went bankrupt, but my point here is that this could have been prevented by proper controls, proper monitoring and fraud awareness training so that the staff who were actually doing the work had some understanding about what they were supposed to be looking at. So, some solutions. 
Well, in terms of the examples that I've just given, which are in the main procurement fraud, one of those top types that were listed in the annual fraud indicator and in the Kroll survey, um, ask for it in writing. Don't put all your details online. There will be some things that you do need to put online, but think about it. Think about what things you should put online and what you shouldn't. Check your contractors. Definitely monitor that they're doing the work. Use analytics. Use spend recovery audits. Have a revolving door policy. So that means make sure that you have some sort of policy that you don't have someone writing a specification for a contract they then leave your organisation and turn up at the contractor who then wins the piece of work. So have a policy, an employment policy on that. Do all staff awareness training. Have a good whistleblowing line. Have an understanding of bribery and corruption. And have controls in place, proportionate to the risks. So, kicking off with our first vote. So, there's a current statement from the leadership team that identifies the specific threats of fraud and corruption faced by the organisation. So, I'd like you to vote now on no, partially and yes. So, the question is, there's a current statement from the leadership team that identifies the specific threats of fraud and corruption faced by the organisation. Okay, so we're getting some answers through, about halfway there. So where would that statement be? It might be in your vision statement, it might be in your counter-fraud strategy. But the key here is, does it have the tone from the top? So we're up to about 86% of people voted. Okay, so let's see what it says. So I'm going to share the results with you. So we've got 33% of people saying yes, that's actually not that many. 53% partially and 13% no. So we're quite interested in the partially, what that could mean. It might mean that specific threats have been identified, but there's no statement from the leadership team. Or it could be that some of you don't know if it's been, um, you know, a statement by the leadership team. So that might be that you, you think it, you think it has, or you hasn't, or or it hasn't. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so I've got here some top ten tips from an organisation called Prefit, and Prefit are a group of employers who run a sort of self-help group. And they've come together to put together some top 10 tips um, on how you can prevent employee fraud. So starting off with prevention, and prevention is better than cure, uh, it costs around £4,000 to recruit someone. So if you recruit a fraudster, um, then you're looking at a hefty cost. Uh, the cost of the advert for the new person, uh, the cost of the disciplinary panel, the cost of uh, resources involved in interviewing. So, and also that I mean, there will be other things connected with that. So, if you've recruited someone who's got qu false qualifications, what were they actually doing when they were in your organisation? There's the cost of an investigation on top. So, it's better to make sure that you recruit the right person with the right qualifications. So, use a risk-based approach. So. Recognise that screening is part of the recruitment process. Checking identity, making sure that they really are who they say they are. And I've got a couple of case studies in a minute which uh, will probably make you smile. Um, there are a number of sources that you could check, so make sure that you don't stick on just one source. So don't just use a reference. And when you do check a reference, make sure that the address is correct. It really is the place that they last worked. The address on the referee isn't the same address as the person you're recruiting. And make sure that there are official documents. Make sure you use criminal record checks where applicable. And remember to share information lawfully. So make sure that people know that you're checking them. 
and uh, you know they're giving some sort of consent about it. And actually, I, I worked for an organisation where we would vet people, and the vetting team was part of the fraud team. Um, and we would quite often get people to sign um, when they were interviewed that they agreed to be vetted. And quite often afterwards, people would say, well, actually, I know I was offered the job and I've signed the vetting form, but I don't want to take the job now. And we would say, well, is that because we've now told them they're going to be vetted? You know, when it happens consistently, then you might wonder. So use readily available research tools, their internet, and many open sources that you can use. And of course, it's not just about closing, closing the gateway, it's about making sure that the people that work for you are who they say they are, and they're not doing anything that they shouldn't be. So checking your existing employees where possible. So I've got another vote now, which is about risk management. Okay, so the organisation's risk management policy includes reference to risks arising from fraud and corruption and guidance on how the risks should be assessed. So are fraud and corruption in your risk management policy and is there guidance on assessing them? No, partially or yes. Can you vote please? Okay, we're about 50% through the votes. Got quite a few yeses coming in. It's very heartening. Nearly there. Eighty percent in. Okay, right, I'm going to share the results with you. So we've got 52% on yes, and then we've got a bit of a split vote, partially and no. So, um, well, about half of you then are saying that yes, you do have something in place. Um, and then again, that partial might be that you're unsure. No is pretty definite. So um, putting partially and yes together, um, it's, it's quite a, a good response. Okay, so moving on to my list of elements. Moving on to my list of elements, we're on to deterrence. So, I think deterrence is really about sending the message out that fraudsters will be caught um, and stopping people before they even think about it. So I think publicity is quite a big part of this. Um, again, not just about the publicity of, uh, you know, this is we've got a fraud hotline, or it could be about um, these are how many sanctions we've delivered this year, these are how many people we've prosecuted, and these were the results of the prosecution. So somebody got sent to prison, or uh, somebody didn't get to keep the money that they got from fraud. So that sort of publicity. Um, and then having a good whistleblowing line, which talks about um, what happens when you whistleblow. So you know that uh, people in your organization have confidence in the line, and they know where to go, and that something happens when they report a fraud or corruption. Fraud awareness campaigns could be via e-learning, could be uh, actual campaigns out where you have a bus on the street that's a fraud awareness bus, um, or could be uh, amnesties. Some people have amnesties on fraud for a period of time. And then culture workshops where you can look at um, measuring the effect of uh, doing a fraud awareness campaign and having culture workshops afterwards with kind of ethical scenarios. And then transparency. So what happens when you do have a fraud? Um, a lot of organizations have um, a counter fraud page where they have um, the hotline and they have a fraud response plan and they have examples of cases that have been taken to prosecution. So being open about what you're doing. And again, that term, tone from the top, so making sure that you have some backing 
from the top of the organisation and some proof that there are consequences to what happens. So, I've got another case study. We talked a bit about screening a few minutes ago um, and I thought I'd share this case with you. Um, I worked somewhere once when we were trying to make the case for pre-employment screening and we employed someone who uh, we took on to manage our grants program. But we didn't do screening at the time and very shortly after we took him on as an employee, we got a whistleblowing call saying that he'd been convicted of fraud. And actually on his application form he had put down that he was doing a university degree and he, can, he had, he was doing a university degree at the Open University in prison um, whilst he was in prison for um, serving time for um, committing fraud. And I mean we suffered quite badly as an organisation, we ended up on the front of uh, the daily newspapers, uh, we didn't lose any money. Uh, but there was there was big reputational damage, and in terms of making the case for me vetting people properly, um, it really did do that, and it shows the importance of preventing something before it happens. So moving on to the next section, which is on investigation, sanction, and redress. So obviously it's better to prevent a fraud if you can, but if you can't, then someone whistleblows or um, you're taking a proactive exercise and you, with the results of that you need to investigate. And so it's important that you have publicity about that. And I talked a few minutes ago about having a web page where you talk about um, what you're doing and um, that you have a team and what the hotline is. So it's important to have publicity and publicity about what you're doing, so if you're prosecuting people and you have sanctions policy, for example, you might have that on the web page, or if you were making a, a statement about having zero tolerance. Um, and it's important to have properly trained staff, so staff who know exactly what they're doing. Um, so if you're doing interviews under caution, you need people who are trained in PACE, uh, Police and Criminal Ed Evidence Act, if you were doing surveillance you would need people who were properly trained to do that. Because if you're going to take cases to court you need to make sure that your staff know exactly what they're doing. And then something about outcomes, reporting outcomes maybe on your web page as part of publicity but also within your organisation in order to get that buy-in from the top, from your audit committee or your chief executive and to send a message out in the public, it's important to show what your outcomes are. And some of the things that you might consider doing might be criminal prosecutions or taking civil action or even internal disciplinaries, which sends a message out within your organisation that it's not okay to commit fraud. And then of course last on that list is making sure that you get your money back. So making sure that people know that fraud won't pay in your organisation. So I have another case study now, um, which is another case, and uh, shortly after I got my vetting team um, in my old job, we, um, we had a case where um, someone was taken on before the vetting had been completed, and there would always be a bit of an argument about, is this post so important that it should be vetted? And we were vetting someone, and the, the manager, recruiting manager, started the person at work before we'd finished the vetting. So um, our vetting officer was looking at the birth certificate for this person and noticed that they put down they'd been born at Homerton Hospital, which is in London. And she said, oh, that's funny because I live by there and um, it hadn't actually been built at that time. We had a police officer who was seconded to our team and he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go around and I'll visit his address. And so he did. Now the post was a caretaker post, and so he'd been in post for about a week. And during that week, from the town hall, he'd taken 14 water coolers, the security vests from behind reception, laptops, memory sticks, passports, and cash. He was arrested, and he went to prison, and he got seven years custodial sentence. After that time, no one ever employed someone 
before we'd finished the vetting. And I think it proved the point that you need to vet or you need to screen proportionate to risk. It doesn't always have to be the director of finance that you're checking. There are many other people who have access to confidential documents or um, information that you might want to protect. Now, we talked a few minutes ago about the importance of collaboration and I've got some good practice here. So this is from the London Borough of Enfield who formed a partnership with their local payback team as part of the police. Um, and they did an initiative to try and use the proceeds of Crime Act to get money back together and uh, the local payback team helped train a financial investigator. So I've got three examples here of cases that Enf where Enfield got the money back under the proceeds of Crime Act. And Enfield actually won an award for this um, and the Fighting Fraud Awards a couple of years ago. So the three examples, as you can see, large sums of money. The first example um, were benefit claimants who'd failed to declare properties, um, three sums there. And the second example, three people for housing benefit fraud, uh, the financial investigation uncovered um, false identities and buying and selling properties and a property of broad um, which resulted in a percentage share of 300,000 for the organisations. And then the other was a joint effort between two councils where a person had used two identities, again using the local payback team at Enfield in partnership with the council and they got a confiscation order for around £500,000. It's really important to publicise cases like these so that people know that action will happen if you commit fraud. So I've got an example now of looking at risks. So some of you might have seen this before. It's called the Fraud Risk Wheel and it was introduced by the Mayor's Office of policing and crime uh, some years ago and my point here is not to go through all of these risks with you but to show you how huge the risks can be. Um, so you can see that there are many little types there what they did was they went through all of their departments and uh, they worked out where the risks were in terms of frauds that had happened, talking to people about risks that might happen and then they risk rated them with a traffic light system. And many other people can do things like that. Um, and so the next thing that I wanted to do was do another vote and talk to you about what your risks might be. Okay. So what are your risks? So I've, I've named three types of fraud risks here. Procurement fraud, because it's fairly topical and we were looking at it a few minutes ago, expenses, and then bribery and corruption. So if you can vote now on which of these is your highest risk. Gosh, some interesting results coming in. So I've been doing some workshops across the country recently and I've been asking about these three types of risks. Um, and so it looks like you're saying pretty much the same thing that I've been hearing across the board. So I'm going to share the results with you now. Uh, procurement fraud is top of that list at 58%, uh, expenses at 29%, and bribery and corruption at 13%. Um, and that's pretty much the picture that I've been getting everywhere that I've been asking the same question. So um, if you were thinking of somewhere to focus your efforts on looking at fraud, then I think procurement fraud might be the place to start. Okay, so um, I'm just going to show you something that we're working on at the moment. Okay, so in January we're going to be launching some fraud risk wheels, looking at different types of fraud. And the first fraud risk wheel that's going to be coming out is on procurement fraud. Um, so if you're interested in knowing more about this, have a look at our website in January. But basically it's based on the idea of a fraud risk wheel. And what you'd need to do is 
clicking on a segment and it'll take you through with what the risks are and then you click again and it will take you through and show you what controls there are and then click again and it will take you through to some case studies. So that's one of the tools that we're hoping to be offered, are hoping to offer from January. Right, so I've got another vote now. Okay, so we've been talking about um, tone from the top, and so this vote is going to be about um, your policies. And so I'm asking, the organisation has an up-to-date counter-fraud and corruption strategy that has been approved by the governing body. So, do you know? Uh, are you not sure? Do you have one? but it hasn't been proved, or do you not have one? So some interesting results coming in. At the moment it looks like yes is the highest answer. And with only 7% as no. Okay, I'm going to close the vote in a second. Well, I've got more people voting on this than we had on the last ones. Okay, so 69% uh, yes, and 25% partially, and 6% no. 6% no is a really good response, I think, because that, that shows that some of you have really got some good kind of culture and uh, are getting the tone from the top right. So that, that's great. Okay, so moving on. Okay, so the role of whistleblowing. So I think whistleblowing is integral to having an anti-fraud culture. Um, and I've got some tips here from Public Concern at Work. Uh, they put together some tips on best practice, and you can pick this up in detail on their website. And I've just taken the bullet points, but there are actually kind of some more details behind these. So we're back on that thing about lead from the top. Um, and I think it's really important that you keep the message fresh. So it's not just that you have um, a whistleblowing policy and it just sits on your website and you don't do anything about it. Um, you need to keep talking about it. You need to train people and make sure you're training them in the right way. So and when I had a whistleblowing policy in one of the organisations I worked in, we realised we didn't have many calls from environmental services. Actually, it turned out that they didn't have have PCs and our whistleblowing line was it was advertised online so um, you know it's about training face to face as well. Uh, building staff trust and so it's sort of linked to having confidence in the line. Um, when I say tell them the good news that's really about giving feedback, making sure that people know that you've got their referral, you're doing something about it um, and you know thanking them for having raised a concern. And encouraging openness. So I think um, as you go on, the more you build a better anti-fraud culture, um, the more likely people are to whistleblow um, openly rather than anonymously. And managing their expectations, and that is that you know you are going to tell them that you've taken on the referral, but you're not going to go back and tell them every stage of what you're doing. So you need to manage people's expectations. So the next slide that I have is an infographic, actually, from Public Concern at Work. And we've got some figures here. You can't see all of them on this screen, but you can pick this infographic up from our website. And you could use it as part of your getting buy-in to having your whistleblowing policy. Um, and you can download it from our website free. But there's some interesting results on this, which is that um, from the calls that PCAW got, um, at least one in ten had a concern about corruption. Fifteen percent of all concerns were about financial malpractice, and fourteen percent were about ethical concerns. One of the other figures in here, which you can see in the top right hand corner, is that thirty nine percent of whistleblowers have less than two years service. You're more likely to whistleblow if you're a newer member of staff. So that probably shows in if you're going to focus your efforts then Focusing on induction is a great thing, but what about your existing workforce and making sure that they know that they can um, 
raise a concern with you. So as I say, you can pick that up from our website. So time for another vote. Now as I've been going around the country, people have been telling me how they have less and less resources. And so I thought I would ask you about what sort of resources you have in order to carry out your counter-fraud work. So my question is, the available resources are sufficient to implement the counter-fraud strategy and reflects the risks that you've identified. So can you vote now, please? Gosh, it's coming in fairly even at the moment. So we've got around 40% partially and yes, did start quite high, but it seems to be going down. <laughs> Okay, about 73%. There's a few more votes to come in yet. Right, there's really quite a mixed response here. Okay, so I'm going to share this with you. Um, it's only 24% saying yes. So a lot of you think that you don't have um, the right resources um, and that it's quite evenly split there, you can see 38% on no and 38% on partially. So maybe there's something there about getting the buy-in or maybe um, it, a lot of you from local authorities, it may be that some of you have lost people to the Single Fraud Investigation Service, you're still trying to make the case to have counter-fraud um, resources in place. Okay, so my next slide then is fairly pertinent because it's about whose responsibility is it. So it's up to you. I think it's up to everybody. Uh, you do need a tone from the top and having the buy-in from the chief executive or your audit committee chair or the leader of the council or the head of your service is really important. Um, it might be your responsibility to put together the policy or put together the plan of action for the anti-fraud culture, but you really do need some buy-in from the top. And you need to show that something happens. You need to have good publicity. And then, well, we have this discussion many times in the counter-fraud world, which is, what is zero tolerance? Now, I don't think it means that everybody gets a sack, and I don't think it means that everyone gets prosecuted. You need to define what it means for your organisation, does it mean that action takes place in all, in all cases? Does it mean that you look at every referral and you make a decision about whether to take it forward or not and that you can justify why you've done that? Does it mean that you make some sort of sanction on all cases? And that's really an individual decision for each organisation um, to decide how to define what zero tolerance means. When you do have your anti-fraud culture in place, you need to make sure that you measure it. And that's some of the things here about culture workshops, having surveys, uh, doing some e-learning, seeing if your referrals go up after your anti-fraud campaigns, having more confidence in whistleblowing lines, having a risk register. And when fraud does occur on your risk register, then you know that everyone's getting involved in trying to mitigate the risks. And is there any action? So it's not just about having a policy, having a strategy, having a whistleblowing line. It's about doing something on top of that. Okay, so I've got here um, a picture of SIPFA's counter-fraud code. Now, the votes that I've asked you today are actually questions from the code. Um, it's applicable to all public service organisations and it's used across local government and central government and um, third sector. And so you can actually use that and you can take it to your audit committee and get them to sign it off and say whether they think there's more that you need to do, there's like a self-assessment in it. So a small bit about the Counter Fraud Centre. I said earlier that we deliver tools and services. Uh, we have qualifications and training, e-learning, and I mentioned to you about the fraud risk wheels which will be available from January. It's not just procurement fraud, but we have a couple of others coming out in January as well. 
We have alerts if you come on our website, and we have a lot of free documentation. So um, I've got in the corner there an example of uh, mandate fraud leaflets that we have on our web page, and you can download them for free, and they've got PowerPoints that you can bespoke, and leaflets and posters. There's much, much more than that available online. So what does it all mean for the practitioner? Well, hopefully it means that you have a raised profile, um, and it means that uh, you get buying from the top, and uh, that you have uh, guidance that you can work from. Okay, so I'm going to look at um, the questions now. And I can see I've got one question in, which is talking about developing a strong business case. Um, we've actually got a document on that, which um, if you want to drop me a line, I'll put my email address um, at the end. Uh, but if you want to drop me a line, I can actually email you a document. We've got a document which takes you through developing a business case for having counter fraud resources. But I would say it's probably a mixture of uh, case studies, what's the volume, and where are the risks, um, and trying to put that to somebody um, in a position of authority who can then support you in taking for, forward your argument. Um, if you can't do that internally, you could look at a similar organisation and try and put the case that way. Um, I'd be happy to chat through with you how you could do that offline if that's helpful. Right, I don't think I've got time for any other questions. So um, if you do want to ask me anything, uh, my details are online. Um, oops, and uh, here's my phone number and my email address. Uh, so contact me if you've got any other questions. Uh, thank you for joining the webinar today, and I hope to hear from you in the future. Thank you.